Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Ask Gian. We're on 31 now. So as always, if you have questions, post them in the comment section below. We'll try and address them. I've got a couple good ones here this time, testing methodology and otherwise. Before getting to the Ask Gian questions, this content is brought to you by AMD FreeSync products, including this LG monitor I've got next to me. This is a 34 inch monitor, 3440 by 1440, and it is a an affordable one at $827. So we've talked about these before. The Acer Predator, the G-Sync monitor I have that we've tested with for 3440 by 1440. That one we've talked about before. It's the most expensive one I've worked with. It's uh, north of $1,000. So that monitor is the one that we basically published some data on and said, hey, 3440 by 1440 is really not that hard of a resolution to sustain if you've got these newer video cards, the $300 plus cards especially. Even the RX 480 does okay with them, GTX 1060 does okay with them, just depends on how much you're willing to sacrifice for your settings to play on an ultra wide resolution. But we've got some content on that and I, I really do think if you've got an issue where, like in some of our use cases, where you're out of physical real estate on the desk, it's sometimes easier to fit an ultra wide, whether it's this one or the Predator, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a sponsor or not, it is just easier to fit an ultra wide in some spaces and from production standpoints, I do prefer working with them. Uh, so that is the, the plug, I guess. We extended a bit there and talked about Acer's product as well, but that's kind of what we do at GN. So uh, first question this week is from Dr. Newberius, who says, why is it that when using a frame rate higher than the refresh rate, the games look and feel smoother? This is a really good question. I've talked about this in the past in a couple different content pieces. I'll, I'll do a, a flyby here for more depth. We have a, con, uh, a video from probably CES 2014 or something where I spoke with NVIDIA on camera about G-Sync. In that video, we explain how, uh, how missing or hitting refresh cycles on a display can impact your fluidity of, of frame rate. And same thing we talked with AMD at CES, I think last year about FreeSync, or maybe I just talked solo on that one, but uh, same idea. So to recap it quickly, there are a few variables here. One of them, the, the question for those who maybe don't uh, follow, it's as simple as if I've got, say, 130 FPS pushing out of my video card, but my monitor is 60 hertz, why does it feel smoother? The answer, the main part of the answer, I think anyway, uh, is because of the latency between the frames. So when we talk about the 1% and 0.1% lows, that many of you are familiar with in the in the review content, those numbers are extrapolated by, or extracted, I should say, by taking a variable called on present. So there's a couple different variables when you measure a frame rate. It's not just you measure the frame rate of a game and its output strictly as FPS, depending on your tool. Our tools, including presentmon and I guess fraps to some degree, will output rather the frame number. So say we record 3000 frames in a 30 second sequence or something like that, uh, then it would be frame one, frame two, frame three, frame four. And then the other number that's plotted against that is the frame time, the milliseconds. So milliseconds between frames, some do a delta and some do a cumulative. So depending on that, you may have frame one happened at zero milliseconds, frame two happened at 13 milliseconds, three happened at 26 milliseconds. So that's how the, the data is recorded. And then from there, you can pull the FPS number by just doing some calculations. Pretty simple stuff can be done on a spreadsheet. You just need a formula to do it and determine how many frames per second you're getting. So that's how the data is created in the charts that we use where you get an average of 1% and 0.1%. As for how it impacts the fluidity, the reason we use these numbers is because when you're testing uh, frame times, the important thing is not just how quickly the frames come out with the FPS number, but also how consistent the frames are from one to the next. So if you've got 100 plus frames coming out of your video card uh, through on present, which is more of an engine level measurement, and you're measuring, say, a frame time, consist, uh, a consistent frame time output, one frame to the next of a couple milliseconds, five, eight milliseconds, something like that, that basically guarantees you're never going to miss a refresh on the monitor depending on your vSync or adaptive sync settings. I'm not going to go into every single uh, of the uh, combinations, permutations here. But depending on your settings there, it means you'll never miss a sync on the monitor. So that happens uh, at, if you've got a 60 hertz, hertz monitor, it would be 
I think uh, 16 milliseconds, every 16 milliseconds it should refresh, 60 hertz, so um, that's, that seems about right. It's eight milliseconds, I believe, for 120 hertz. So you never miss one of those, that's one thing. The next thing, uh, regardless of sync settings, even if you've got V-Sync disabled and you have no adaptive sync, like FreeSync, this thing would have, or G-Sync, the competition to this thing, if you've got no adaptive sync, no V-Sync, the next thing to look at are going to be dips. So the dips in frame rate throughput are probably going to be less bad. You're less likely to fall below the refresh on the display. If let's, I don't know what this refresh is off the top of my head, but let's just pretend this monitor is a 60 hertz refresh and we have no free sync enabled. So if it's 60 hertz refresh and uh, we start dipping to 20, 30 FPS in our low values, not only is that visible anyway, because the, it'll just look like a stutter in gameplay, uh, you start entering into territory of either tearing or stuttering, depending on, again, your sync settings. V-Sync will eliminate tearing, but can introduce stuttering if you fall below the refresh rate of the display. And no V-Sync means that you get a lot of tearing, but uh, depending on if you're, what your frame rate is, uh, but you eliminate stuttering. So normally when you talk to someone like an esports player, they will almost always favor tearing to stuttering because in one event with a tear, it's basically you imagine a frame being drawn and then a new frame starts getting drawn on top of it. When a monitor paints a frame, it does it from the top left to the bottom right. So it'll actually, if you, if you took a super high speed camera or just even a screen capture solution and you measured as it drew frames, you would see it painting pixels from the top left to the top right and all the way down uh, till you got to the bottom right. That obviously happens exceptionally fast, but uh, that is part of the uh, sort of what you're looking at when, when there's a tear. So if there's a tear, it'll be an instance where you might have a tree vertical object that you can see is no longer aligned because one frame has drawn on top of another and there's a runt frame there, we call it. Uh, or if there's stuttering, it's the opposite issue where the frames come out just fine and they're complete frames, no real tearing in your graphics and your textures, but instead it'll kind of feel like there's a repeat. So it'll take the previous frame and effectively reproject it. That's more of a VR term, but you get the idea. Reproject the previous frame and uh, then you have sort of missing data for the, the one frame you're on currently until the next one draws. That happens when you've missed a refresh cycle on the monitor. So if your monitor is expecting a frame every eight or 16 milliseconds, it doesn't draw in time, it misses that refresh, uh, and then reprojects the previous frame, then the next eight or 16 millisecond cycle, you'll get a new frame. So that's eight to 16 milliseconds in there where you have no frame, that's perceived to the user as a stutter. So I think that starts to answer the question. Um, that's, if you have a higher frame rate, these things are less of a concern. You're gonna be above thresholds where it's more visible to the user. Higher frame rate generally, not always, if you look at our uh, Battlefield 1 results, generally a higher frame rate does coincide with better frame times. Not always the case, again, but if you have better frame times, you're less likely to have those uh, noticeable dips and the, the inconsistency is what kills it. So you could have 100 FPS output, but if you have frame times that are 10, 10, 10 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, then you have one that's 18 or 24, doesn't have to be multiple, but uh, something like that, then you'll notice it. Um, and that does tend to happen more often with a lower end device or with lower frame rate than not. So uh, I said I wasn't gonna explain the whole thing, but I think that basically explains the whole thing that was in the previous content. You can still find more if you're curious about it. We've written about it before on the website. Click on Specs Dictionary and click on, uh, you can read about uh, screen tearing. Screen tearing, I've got information there. Next question is Adrian Cavadu who says, why are games, most AAA games, don't utilize the extra power of hyper-threading. Doesn't make any sense that most modern games require four cores and not utilizing CPUs with more than four cores or with hyper-threading. Thanks for answering. This is a good place to go and look at our interview with Sean Tracy from the Star Citizen team, specifically the interview where we talk about CPU thread management. And if someone wants to dig that up and post it in the comments below, that'd be great because I'm gonna keep listing things to, to go to and forget to link them in the description. But we talk about job management there. 
that's part of it. Uh, basically, this is on a development side, engine side more than anything. The engines need to be all modernized to support more threads. CryEngine, they made a big deal out of this maybe two and a half years ago when CryEngine started supporting eight threads. That was a big deal. And the way they did it then is different from now. Back then, an engine would basically say, we have a game render thread, that's generally core one or thread one that starts really get abused. And we have a, an audio thread, a physics thread, an AI thread, and so on. I don't have all of them off the top of my head, but that's, that's, those are the core ones. Uh, so generally with engines, you will see most of the abuse on the first core, regardless of whether you have hyper-threading. And a lot of these engines really only efficiently utilize two cores, even though they might ask for four as a requirement. The other two might just be juggling uh, AI, which sometimes is non-existent or very low load, depending on what you're playing. And then, of course, audio is generally the other one. Uh, so that is, that is largely an engine factor. Now, as for hyper-threading specifically, there are a few games where you can see a hyper-threading benefit. One of them, as I've mentioned before, is Metro Last Light. It's more of a benchmark than a game at this point. But it proves the concept that uh, in the averages with Metro Last Light, with hyper-threading and without hyper-threading, you'll see that they look pretty much the same. But when looking at the low performance, 0.1% low, 1% low values that we test, those can be gapped as much as 2x, depending on uh, what video card is being tested. And that's because of hyper-threading being disabled. You get a big reduction of 0.1% in that game. So that's potentially more stutters visible. Sometimes we would see, I don't remember this specific card, but this was during the 900 series, where I was very confused for about a week because my results were tested the same way as previously, but they looked different in the low numbers. And that was because hyper-threading was disabled. So uh, it is largely a game side issue though, and an engine side issue. I, we'll, we'll probably see more SMT, which is the sort of base technology that hyper-threading is, is Intel's version. We'll see more SMT support, I think, going forward because Zen will also be using SMT now. Uh, so maybe developers will have more reason to actually explicitly support a lot of threads, but still, end of the day, it's still a lot of thread one and thread two occupation. Uh, lower level APIs may assist with that in the future because render tasks are getting moved off of thread one, which is bottlenecking everything uh, in, the, uh, in the sequence because it's a sequential processor. Next question is Timo for Life, who's definitely posted before, says, is overclocking my monitor safe? Will it reduce the lifespan? I clocked mine to 66 hertz. Is it worth it? 66 hertz, I don't know if that's worth it. Uh, it's a, you got a 10% overclock. It's not really a big deal. Can you really perceive an extra 6 FPS, basically, is the question. Maybe you can, but uh, we've done articles on this. Michael Kearns, one of our writers, is more of an expert on this than I am. He's done a lot of monitor overclocking. The, the quick answer, is overclocking safe? No, it is never safe. Uh, it's, it's sort of safe with GPUs these days. They do have things to stop you from really damaging something. But if you really start playing around with things, following guides that are more advanced and using tools that maybe you shouldn't, then no, it's, it's not safe. You can always damage something, like unlocking voltage or uh, whatever, flashing BIOS in the case of video cards. As for monitors specifically, you can pretty safely adjust within a reasonable range. 10% is normally fine. We've gotten up to uh, 80 hertz, I think, on 60 hertz displays, and normally the, the Korean displays will support this better, the ones without scalers. Um, but those those tend to be the ones to play around with because you can get them cheap, you can overclock them. I've read stories about people hitting 100 hertz or 120 hertz. I've never done that myself or seen it in person. So that would certainly be worth it if you could hit that. But uh, you, you are going to burn out the display faster potentially. And it's for a few reasons. One, it wasn't built to handle that. And two, these things, especially like the Predator that I'm dealing with, do generate a good amount of heat. It's a lot of power to drive a display and you got to think about it like there's, I'm looking at the back of this one, there's really no ventilation. There's a little bit of ventilation uh, in the bottom, it feels like. But that's really all you get for displays. A lot of the heat radiates out of the front, but there is heat inside where all of the logic and the PCB, uh, any power components would be. And when you're overclocking anything, you're generally increasing the power to the device, the, whatever's doing the oscillating cycle uh, to overclock it and increasing the, Power increases the temperature, 
There's no active cooling in there generally, not in any of the monitors I use anyway. Um, so that, yeah, you could probably shorten the lifespan if you're not too careful, but uh, read our overclocking guide though for monitors specifically. That will address the question uh, very directly for, for anyone who's interested in doing it. We have a how-to as well in there. One of the next questions is, <laughs> uh, foreign gaming tech says, damn Steve, you always look so tired. Yes, my question would be, as far as I've heard, most of the monitoring applications show requested VRAM, not actually used VRAM. So it shows how much the game wants, not how much it uses. How true is that? Are there ways to measure occupied VRAM instead of requested? That is true, uh, and that is accurate. If you're using GPU-Z, and it says this game is using four gigabytes of video memory, and you have a four gigabyte card, it doesn't mean that you're caching out of your memory or you're exceeding your memory limitation. What it probably means is that the game said, uh, I want four gigabytes of video RAM available. And so that's, it allocated it. It doesn't mean it's getting used. Now you can test this theory if you plug in something like a 12 gigabyte Titan X and it starts, Black Ops starts requesting 12 gigabytes of memory, then we know there's really no way this game is using 12 gigabytes of video memory actually. You could put in an eight gigabyte card or six gigabyte card and it probably performs the same clock for clock, spec for spec, um, but it's requesting all of it. So yes, that is true. Measuring accurately uh, can be done with low-level APIs. The ISVs are generally doing it. I think Gears of War actually taps into its real VRAM consumption, but I'm not positive on that. Uh, so that's, that's maybe the future, but no software exists that I am aware of that would accurately tell you how much video RAM is actually used. Uh, I'm sure someone like Corsair would be able to build something like that because they work with memory as a, as a business. But we don't have anything, and as far as I'm aware, there's no good public tool that is accurate for that. Next question, FD1. You mentioned in the previous video that Intel's PR has changed the point where you would rather buy it. That would be the CPU then request one for review. Could you elaborate on that? What has changed specifically if you could walk us through the process of acquiring tech for review? I'll keep this short. Uh, elaborate on Intel's PR changing. I mean, it's just this happens all the time in the industry. PR people move around a lot. Everyone in the industry moves around a lot. Um, PR especially though. On one end, it can be good. If they move to another company, we can get connection with the company we may not have talked to before because there's PR there that we're familiar with. Uh, the other hand, it could be bad because you might not have a way to get back in touch with the company that they left. In Intel's case, it was an internal shuffling. And I just, I've probably been put in contact with four or five people in the last two years. I can't keep track of them. Half of them don't reply uh, because their job titles change without me knowing, of course, why would, you know, if they don't make a public announcement about it. So it's, just, it's too much work to try and keep in touch with people at Intel. They're a large company. Uh, it's easier to buy the product or get it through an SI and use it as a loaner and then send it back later. So that's the, the short of that. And then as for what's the process of getting a product to review, uh, it's, it's basically eight years of establishing a brand and demanding respect for in-depth work, which there's not a whole lot of these days. Uh, an on-tech tech report, PC perspective, legit reviews certainly. Um, but not a whole lot of it now. And I think that kind of generally does actually get respect. So it's basically just email and ask for it. We have to turn away a lot of products. Uh, and there's plenty more that are not finished being tested yet because it's too much comes in. So we actually, a lot of the time these days, they reach out to us, ask if we want it. And I have to turn away a lot of stuff because I don't want to accept it if we can't actually review it. So uh, that's kind of the process, pretty simple. Last question. Uh, Kiriji Otaku this is going to be good I'm sure Dear Steve can we get a sexy hair flip at the end of the video No Thank you for watching as always Patreon like the post show video Comments this in the comments below Questions for next time Subscribe for more I will see you all next time